This is a weird day. Why is it a weird day? Because my wife is out in the driveway right now using a power tool to carve pumpkins. That's right. She's doing a power tool carve pumpkin story. Uh, she's also, just this past week, made apple chutney, made pumpkin seeds four ways, including a pumpkin pie flavored pumpkin seed mix. She has been uh, organizing a pantry in a very cool way that includes uh, paint and curtains and all sorts of things that makes our pantry uh, kind of sexy. And uh, finally, she's created spooky face masks. My wife, a lot of you may not know this, she actually does a magazine every single month. It's like this beautiful online downloadable PDF magazine with videos, like tons of videos from her. She, she literally spends the entire month putting together these amazing magazines. It's called the Healthy home workshop. And whether you are a complete bachelor who just wants to sit at home, but occasionally have people over and completely impress them and knock their socks off with your cooking and the feng shui of your home, or whether you are a a family mom who wants to make your family better than all the other families out there, because we all know that's the way moms think, uh, you should check out her Healthy Home Workshop. How do you do it? Just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash inner circle. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash inner circle, and you can check that out. Now, today's podcast that you are about to listen to is pretty interesting. It's about shattering world swim records on 25-piece fried chicken buckets, climbing mountains while eating defatted, vegan, grass-fed, Argentinian liver anhydrate, and much more. Now, before we jump into today's show, I also wanted to mention to you something else kind of weird, and that's propolis. Propolis, P-R-O-P-O-L-I-S. What is propolis? Well, it is the immune system of a beehive. It's what's it's what a, a bees use to sterilize their hive to protect their hive from things like bacteria and parasites and virus. It's the sticky substance that they make from plant and tree resins. Well, propolis was actually the term given to this stuff by Aristotle. Remember Aristotle? Yeah, that guy. Uh, Its medicinal uses date back to at least 300 BC. It's got over 300 active compounds, and it's good for anything immune related because it's antiviral and antifungal and antibiotics. You could like take it on an airplane or a bus and spray it in your mouth and make your immune system bulletproof. So, It also works, by the way, on cold sores and canker sores for those of you walking around with giant sores in your mouth. And even gingivitis and bad breath, it can treat cuts, burns, wounds. It's like a freaking Swiss army knife for your immune system. And they get this stuff from the bees. Kids can even use it. So uh, the propolis that I actually have in my fridge right now, I've been playing around with it. It actually tastes really good. It's made by this company called Beekeepers Naturals. Bee keepers naturals and they're giving everybody who's listening in a 10 percent discount so to get that you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash beekeeper just like it sounds bengreenfieldfitness.com slash beekeeper and use code ben to get 10 percent off of their fantastic propolis literally just spray it in your mouth and you're off to the races so check it out and now on to today's show in this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show. I never had any issues psychologically showing up ready for an event. I always was a great competitor. I couldn't wait to get in the water. I didn't care who you were. Went toe-to-toe with the biggest and baddest boys in the world, and none of them scared me. I just couldn't wait to get in and take them out. For me, I've always had the attitude of make the journey or the training the most miserable aspect of what it is you're going to do if you're aiming for an event so that when you get to the event, all of that work is behind you. You paid a dear price for it, but you know unequivocally when you show up, I'm ready. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place. Right here, right now. 
on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield here, and I actually first met, or I guess got introduced to today's podcast guest when I got this bottle of strange pills in the mail. And normally I would toss those bottles into my pantry or my garage with all the other random powders and oils and capsules and pills and lotions and creams and strange devices that fit into various orifices of your body you know, that, that <laughs> all <laughs> often, <laughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm coughing on my green smoothie, speaking of strange things in your body. Uh, and, and so all these things show up at my house, but, but this, uh, this bottle kind of intrigued me because along with echinacea and beetroot extract, which I know about, the bottle also had some other stuff I'd never heard of, like, uh, Aphanizomenon floss aquae. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, how about this one? Defatted vegan grass fed Argentinian liver and hydrate. I've heard of liver before, but not, not that particular flavor. Um, or, or a special version of cordyceps uh, called, called a senesis. So, long story short, I ended up calling up this guy. And, um, he, and this is the guy who had sent it to me and asked him what it was for. And it turns out that he. And this bottle uh, uh, are far from normal. And uh, you're going to find out why in today's episode. He's got quite the story, quite the interesting guy, quite the athlete as well. So his name is Craig, Craig Dinkle. And uh, if you are listening in, you get intrigued with with Craig and his story and what we talk about because he's he's got some some very... Um, I guess I, I, I would call it like uh, enchanting and, and edgy info that we haven't talked about much on the podcast before. If you find this stuff intriguing, go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig for today's show notes. See, Craig, I named the whole podcast after you. Yeah, I feel honored. I feel honored. <laughs> yeah, well, you you should be, man. Um, I, 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 I was looking over your resume in terms of, of for example, especially your, your swim performances. Um, you know, while training for the Olympics, I mean, you, you were training with Navy SEALs, you were rooming with professional baseball players. I know you were teammates with, with Dara Torres, who's a, who's a pretty highly visible swimmer. And, you know, along with the, uh, the Michael Phelps of water polo, uh, the mm -hmm. guy named Terry Schroeder. And, and I think only me and a small handful of listeners as, as X or, or current water polo nerds, uh, would know who he <laughs> is, but that is uh, that is pretty cool. And then you also have trained a ton of celebrities. I know you worked with Willie Nelson and you worked with uh, Johnny Mandel and Ray Parker Jr. and the guitarist for the Eagles. And I think one of the gals who toured with with Elvis Presley and, and Bruce Jenner oh, yeah. and all, all sorts of really interesting people. So you've, uh, you've been all over the place, man. So, well, except for this show. So welcome to this show. <laughs> well, thanks. It's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure to be here and, uh, in such esteemed companies yourself, high regard oh. for you and always have. Oh, well, thank you. That's probably the only time today I'll be called esteemed. <laughs> um, so, so you got your start in the competitive sports world with swimming, I know, uh, but I thought it was kind of intriguing. You told me how exactly you got introduced to, to swimming. Can you, uh, fill the listeners in? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I I've told this story in a couple of other a uh, couple of other spots as well. But uh, I was a two year old kid and uh, was very interested in the water. And uh, one day, family was on a pool deck, Southern California, and um, decided I'd find out what it was like to get in the water. So uh, I sort of uh, parents weren't paying attention; they weren't doing their job that day. But my uh, older brother, who at the time was five years old, was doing his job that day. So what happened was I I uh, was curious and I. I slipped into the shallow end, went down the stairs. Don't even know how I could do that at two years old, but managed to get down the stairs and uh, started floating pretty well off uh, uh, off into the pool. And next thing I knew, I was up against the side of the wall and I was drowning. I was drowning. I wasn't. I wasn't able. To, I wasn't. I hadn't sunk to the bottom or anything. I was on the surface. But yeah, I can remember that like That's it was crazy. yesterday. That's crazy. You were two, and you can remember that. I remember it just exactly as if it happened yesterday. I wonder if that's exactly. common to be able to remember a, a traumatic experience like that when you're when you're that young. Because some people will say they can remember being birthed. It, yeah, see that that <laughs> that goes that goes back further than I, uh, yeah. uh, than I than I can go. And it's funny you say that because I had a friend when I was in high school, actually uh, my best friend's mother, who 
claimed and um, look at it. I'm just telling you what she told me. I'm not saying that that uh, that I necessarily go here, but uh, I'll never forget her telling me she can remember being in the womb. Now, that seems like a huge stretch to me, but this lady was a v- pretty special lady, r- really a true genius and a uh, really an, an amazing human being, someone whose feet were cleanly planted on the ground. And so I had no reason to doubt her, but I thought, well, I, you know, no, the earliest the earliest recollections I have are just around two years old. So but the funny thing about your uh, your question, you know, or statement about yeah. traumatic experiences is that, you know, my brother dove in from the uh, deep end of the pool. He happened to see me. He's only five years old and uh, yeah, was able to push me out and get Jeez. me to. At, yeah, at crazy. five years old, that's kind of that's kind of unique, I think. Um, it's crazy. I may, maybe they uh, what, what you guys were in California. At that time, yeah, it was Santa Barbara. Okay, but you were you were born and raised in in Massachusetts, right? Yes, Boston, Massachusetts, okay. and uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Something must, something must have been in the water down in California for your five year old brother to be able to pull you out of a pool from drowning. So well, he uh, was an he, you know look at he was I, I grant you he was only five years old and hardly formed as a human being, but he ended up being a pretty really uh, amazing guy. Six boys in my family, and uh, all of us have varying levels of success and. Uh, stories to tell in life. Yeah. But uh, of all of us, he he ended up having really the most interesting story of any of us. We lost him to to uh, cancer about five years ago, which was a real, which is a real drag, but uh, great guy. And he saved my life then. And speaking about traumatic experiences, I, you know, my family did not treat that as if it was some sort of uh, major, you know, 911 emergency to their credit. Uh, they understood really? the serious. Yeah, they understood the seriousness of the situation. And I and I say that because I can see that imagery in my mind, too. I can see, you know, the sort of nervous laughter, the comfort coming from glad this didn't get any worse. And no one was screaming or yelling or running around or behaving like uh, someone just about died, which I think was a good thing. And so I, I don't know if I would have ended up later down the line becoming a swimmer or not had they uh, had they handled it differently. But I didn't have any you know, it's just an, <laughs> it, was, it just ended up being an experience. That's the trick to raising a world class swimmer. Pretend like drowning happens every day, and it's the most normal thing in the world. And your your kids will be bulletproof to it. You know, I, I um my my dad's uh, brother, who who also uh, sadly is not with us any longer. Um, he uh, grew up as an amazing swimmer. I know when he was, I think four or five. My grandma tells me stories about how he would, you know, swim underwater. And I believe uh, the the distance that he got close to underwater at five was uh, somewhere over 100, somewhere between 100 and 150. That's for meters. So that's, you know, back and forth um, quite a few times under the water for for a little boy to be able to do. But it's pretty amazing. You know, I, I have this I have this kind of fascination with water, did a bunch of cold water swimming before this episode just to get myself ready to interview you. And yeah, you're the crazy uh, guy here. You're the crazy guy. Yeah. I read all about you and your cold water <laughs> stuff, and yeah. that's tough stuff. I couldn't do that. Yeah, well, you you you, you develop enough brown fat and enough <laughs> endothelial nitric oxide production, and and even a skinny guy like me can can handle it without being one of those big old fat polar bear swimmers. So you uh, after that, you got into competitive swimming. Yeah, well, the bottom line is the, the the brother, you know, will jump jump forward many years back in Boston now, and and that brother who who uh, saved my life became a swimmer, and so I just followed him into the sport because I loved him and idolized him. So that's that's really how it began. I wasn't I wasn't you know doing anything in particular. So when you got into uh, high school as a swimmer, uh, one of the things that I know you told me was you dropped seven seconds in your hundred yard freestyle to actually become a competitive swimmer to be able to to kind of like get into college, and and that's you know for anybody who swims that's a a boatload of time. No pun intended there. So what uh, what did you do to actually drop that amount of time in freestyle swimming? Uh, that's a really good question. And despite the fact it was me, it could have been anybody. And I say very egolessly it, that that is a boatload of time. It's it's inexplicable. It's an inexplicable drop, really. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be like like a lot of people. Let's let's say like a fast swim time for an average like Ironman triathlete, for example, would be maybe you could do a minute and, you know, 15 seconds for a hundred meter time. You're talking about dropping that down, you know, for somebody who's, who's, you know, recreational swimmer closer down to like a, a minute, you know, down to like one Oh eight from a one fifteen, which is a ton of time. Right. That's right. I think, you know, if, as I look back at that, I think I did start my competitive swimming in new England. I was not your everyday 
athlete back then. I, I seemed to possess some natural talent. I didn't train that hard. I didn't take it seriously. I had no reason to. It wasn't the environment I was in at that time was not a highly competitive environment, although I was always highly competitive. Whenever I was in uh, an event, I was always there to win. But the training is just nothing compared to what they did in California. And I didn't understand how to train. And I don't think the coaches were all that good. And uh, I had some minimal success there. And, and one day, one day in New England at a, at a swim meet, I just for, for absolutely no good reason broke the record of the fastest swimmer in New England, who was three years older than me. And that guy I knew, and he's a very, very disciplined athlete, trained very hard. I used to watch him work out all the time. Another one of my idols just happened to be on the same team, just the uh, the senior part of the team, the varsity team. Um, and when I broke his record, I thought very objectively, I was 15, and I thought, well, gee, you know, maybe there's something here, and I ought to pay a little more attention to this. And along with that thinking, the family then moved to California. And I think to answer your question, I think I just landed at the right place at the at the right time. Well, uh, how do I say this? Uh, I had a lot of fire in me, a, yeah. a ton, a ton. Of, it's almost indescribable amount of fire in my belly for reasons not having to do with just wanting to win, but for other reasons. So I landed at the right place. All of a sudden, I was coddled by coaches. I had a great, you know, I had a great uh, head coach. I had a stroke coach. I happened to land on a team where one of the best swimmers in Southern California was was also on the team. And so right away, I had this this heavy, you know, in, inauguration to what it meant to be a California swimmer. Just bang, just like that. So training changed dramatically. I, st- I wasn't working out the width of the pool anymore and occasionally the length of the pool. And I was learning all about hypoxic training, stroke training, measured stroke training. Uh, you mentioned uh, the kid who could swim underwater 100, 100. And right. That's a long, that's a long, long, I mean, I respect that. That is some tough, tough stuff to do. I think maybe the best I could do uh, as an adult was maybe 75 to 100 yards, not meters. You mentioned meters, which is a big difference. So that's that's an amazing thing. So all these things were being introduced to me, and it was highly focused, and it was all, you know, driven toward winning at that time. And so I think that, you know, I left scene A, New England, with, uh, you know, probably some natural talent that just sort of bubbled up. I think that's fair to say, because it wasn't right for me to break the record of a guy who lived his life competing at the highest levels and training at the hardest levels. And for me to just show up, the, the meet that I broke that record in, I wasn't even going to go to. I was yeah. just like, oh, I've got nothing to do today. I might as well just go to the meet. And so it just happened like that. So I think that what happened was I spent a year then, of course, uh, training in that program. And the next year at, uh, at what they call CIF, which is the equivalent to the high school division one state meet, I just dropped seven seconds. I mean, I just, it was wow. just... Just there it was. So you were just it, doing a whole cluster of training modalities from hypoxic training to strength training to obviously swim training. Were you were you using, because I know you're very in, into, and we'll talk about this later on, like, you know, fringe ingredients, supplements, um, legal, we should throw in. But were, were <laughs> yes. you into that stuff back then? Like, did you, you, know, did you uh, have like a, a keen interest in health and food and supplements or were you... Uh, were you like me? I was a collegiate tennis player, and I, I uh, every day before practice would roll into McDonald's and grab Big Mac, supersized fries, Dr. Pepper. Uh, that would fuel tennis every day. No, I think you really honestly just described what most most athletes do. I mean, that's that is how we eat. It's it's a myth, really, that athletes that, at, with exception, there are exceptions to this rule. I, D- Dara became an exception later because she was competing in her forties and winning. You mean Dara Torres, the Dara Torres, yeah. she did, she did the Olympics. She was what, 40? Yes. 42, 42, 42 years old yeah. was her last Olympics. And she just barely, she just missed the gold medal in her last Olympics by, I think two one hundredths of a second. I mean, she was effectively a gold medalist at 42 years old. She got the silver. That's crazy. Insane, insane. And so someone like her at that, at that stage of life, you have to make some serious shifts and she made a ton of them. I mean, she did lots of things differently, but no, I think, you know, guys like you and me, when we're in college, you know, look at, I used to go just, just to compete with you on the eating thing. My friend and my friends and I would get out of workouts. We'd, we'd go home. We'd, we'd get a couple bucks from our parents and we'd shoot over to Kentucky fried chicken and we would buy the biggest bucket they had, whatever that was, I think it was a 22 piece or 25 piece bucket back in those days. And we just sit down at, we just sit down at the, at the dinner table there or the restaurant table and just start eating fried chicken. So I, I'd say that uh, my, my eating habits 
hadn't changed yet. That was going to happen later. But I did begin the exercise of taking supplements and just finding out what might work without much thought, just sort of listening to people and, and hearing what they had to say. And uh, it began with something as simple and as basic as salt, salt tablets. Um, I figured I was outdoors, you know, in California, you swim outdoors, you're in, you're in the sun all the time. So, yeah. um, you know, you're burning off, uh, you're burning off a lot of energy and, uh, blowing out a lot of salts and a lot of sodium. And that for some reason that seemed in those days to be the place to begin. And later it gets uh, toward my second Olympic run. It gets much more intense as I, as I start figuring out, uh, what's going on in between that salt period and the, uh, the more intense trying everything under the sun period. Gotcha. Okay. So you went, you wound up swimming in the Olympics. I did college. not make, no, I did not. I wish I could say I had, uh, the first, oh, you, you, I'm sorry, you, you were training for the Olympics. Yes. I qualified for Olympic trials twice and competed twice in Olympic trials, but I didn't make the team. Okay. Got it. So, but, but you had, you had a bunch of NCAA records, uh, yes. a bunch of all American records. I know you were inducted to, uh, cause you, you were swimming for Cal state, right? That's right. Right. Okay. Cal State Northridge at that time. And you're like in their Hall of Fame as a swimmer. That's correct. Yeah. I was the fastest inductee into their Hall of Fame. And what about yeah. during that time? Were you in, were you into like uh, supplements or fringe training methods during that time? I tell you, yes, that that's where I think. Uh, so that puts me into college. And uh, I, uh, I did start trying to figure out what was out there, what might give me a biological edge, because you know, we all knew that P, you know, PEDs have been around a long time. And at, at the Olympic level, at the Olympic trial level, when you get out of the pool, you, if, you, if you made the team, you get out of the pool, you sit on a chair, and they pulled your blood right there on the deck. In the oh, days really? That I was you, don't, you, don't, you don't pee into a cup. They just take your blood right there, huh? Then, then they did. Then wow. That's how they did it then. A nurse would come out, and they'd just strap a tourniquet around your Serious. arm. Serious. <laughs> yeah. And they, that's what the, yeah, the second Olympic trials I was in was in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, I'll never forget seeing them come out on, you know, and the nurses, the, the swimmers get out of the water, get in their chairs right by the starting blocks, and the nurses come out and pull blood right there. There was nowhere to go, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. They wanted to make sure that you had no chance, if you were cheating, to go do something in the locker room. Yeah somewhere else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd say that, uh, yeah, by this time then I'm starting to experiment with the fairly usual off the shelf stuff. So I'm trying B pollen. I don't know how unusual some of these things are, but you know, B pollen, Royal jelly, things along those lines, uh, the usual E supplement C B you name it. If it was there to take, I tried it. And, uh, I did that for a long time. Yeah, I've, I've tried bee pollen and royal jelly before. They actually, they do have you know, those, those. I guess would be considered somewhat fringe, but uh, bee pollen is is actually really really good for people who have like hay fever and allergenic issues. It's kind of like uh, one of those counterintuitive type of things. You know, eating small amounts. What do they call it? Hair of the dog when you have yes. a bloody yes. mary in the morning after drinking. Bee pollen has some very interesting like natural allergy relief properties, which I think is is kind of cool. And then royal jelly, um, that's one of those things where, you know, I, I don't know if you're into this same concept that I am, that nature gives you clues, but, you know, you look at something like the aloe vera plant and how quickly it regenerates after having its limbs cut off, and it actually can increase your uh, your ability to produce stem cells when you consume, like, aloe vera gels. Or in the case of, like, royal jelly, you know, that's what they use to uh, feed the larvae it's, uh, and the, the adult queen. It's like the honeybee secretion. And it's one of those things. It's almost like, uh, you know, I, I recently wrote a blog post about how athletes are now injecting themselves with like growth hormones and insulin, like growth factor and things like that. And, and Royal jelly and, and aloe vera and all these things that, that cause growth in your body or, you know, colostrum, et cetera. They're actually really cool, cool, uh, natural forms of that. But bee pollen and Royal jelly, I would say if you were taking those in college as a swimmer, that's a, uh, that's something a lot of swimmers I would say, and, and college athletes, uh, have not tapped into. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I do subscribe to that thinking. If you look around nature, you can find a lot of clues and a lot of answers. And it, and it brings up another important issue that I've held since those days, which is, as you mentioned, it works for some people in some cases and in particular circumstances, and other bodies may not work with it. Those things didn't work with me. So, But I'm a big, big believer in anecdotal support. You can get academic studies, you can get clinical studies, you can get all kinds of studies that back up a given supplement or a product to in uh, to help you perform better whether it's cognitive or or biological 
and those things may not work for you. And you can, and there's all kinds of undocumented or documented, let's say, but not clinical studied or not scientifically validated supplements that do work for people. Oh and yeah, so, sure. I yeah. mean, like right now, if you, if you hear me opening that, uh, little bottle of water yes. on my desk. I'm drinking, yes. I'm drinking water that's, you know, like it's, it's structured and it's clustered and it's at a specific pH after it goes through the filter in my house and everything. And, and yeah, there's not a lot of research behind that in terms of it, say, you know, increasing intracellular hydration, for example. But it, um, you know, for me personally, I feel a distinct difference in terms of hydration, in terms of me drinking tons of water and not actually peeing out tons of water because it's actually hydrating my cells. I mean, it, it, it really is interesting to use yourself as, as a bit of a guinea pig safely. Of exactly. Course. I, I, I endorse guinea pigging water on yourself. I don't, I don't <laughs> endorse that with, with some other things that one can, one can uh, inject into their body. But anyway, so you, so you wound up after swimming, uh, going on and getting into the fitness business. Yeah, I did. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I had a background in music. My first degree was in ethnomusicology, which which oh, at the time, yeah, at that time there were no such degrees. Today, today there are. That you could UCLA, I think, has one, and uh, many many schools have degrees in ethnomusicology. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I just was an athlete, and I and I loved music, and I played guitar, and I figured somehow maybe I'd work my way into the rock and roll scene, become a musician, but. Uh, there was no money to be made in music right out of college. So the only thing I knew, and I knew inside out and backwards, was training and fitness. I, I knew that stuff. So I started the private fitness business, and that's how I met some of the people that you'd mentioned earlier. I had a lot of fun doing that while I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. And by the way, I, I think it, it's, it, it's only now that I've really figured out that I really want to do, and I'm doing it now. This is you know what we're doing now, and the business that I've, I've gotten into here is a lot of fun, and it really puts me back in my wheelhouse. But yeah, that's what I did for a while. So I had a lot of celebrity clientele, and it was very interesting to work with some of those folks. And not Willie Nelson directly, but his harp player, his harmonica player, uh, was a client of mine and a good friend and still a friend today. And uh, a lot of those people are still friends today, but you trained, a lot of fun. you trained a lot of musicians. Is that just like random that you had a degree in music and trained a lot of musicians or were they kind of drawn to you? Hmm. Let's see now. Um, that's true. That's a good point. I mean, I also trained Jack Tempchin, whose name you don't know and no one listening knows, but Jack Tempchin wrote many, many of the hits for the Eagles, which I'm sure everybody knows. And if they don't, a little bit of research will, you know, tell them, tell them who they are. So Jack was a friend of mine and, uh, and Don Felder for the Eagles was a, a friend at the time. I haven't talked to Don in a long, long time. And Mickey for, uh, uh, Willie Nelson, who else? Mike Riley guy played with the Allman brothers, Southern rock band. Uh, I guess you're right. <laughs> I guess I never really, so, yeah, that's, I, in, that's interesting. <laughs> Hey, I want to make a quick interruption to ask you if you ever saw Napoleon Dynamite and the ball. Is it the ball? No, it's not a ball. It's a prom. It's a prom that Napoleon Dynamite goes to. Not a ball. A ball would be Cinderella. And he's wearing this horrid suit, like a like a suit coat. Or maybe it's his little, little Mexican friend in there. I, I forget that guy's name. But either way. Just a horrible, like like Southern Idaho fashion, and the same type of fashion that you get, like these uh, these big stores where you go and you buy the suit that literally makes your shoulders stick out ten feet on either side with the huge ugly buttons in the middle. You know, suits can look really, really crappy on people, but not my suit. I got a new suit. Uh, it fits my body. It hugs my body like a glove. It makes me look really good. At least I think so. It is olive green. It's got like gray polka dots on it. I custom designed the whole thing in a showroom. It even says Mr. Greenfield on the lapel. Honestly, like do, do a Google image search for Ben Greenfield suit and you might see me wearing it. Uh, anyways, though, I feel good in it. I feel confident in it. And it actually, it fits well. It's comfortable. And anybody can get a premium suit just like the one that I got for a fraction of the price of any other suit on the face of the planet. Most made-to-measure premium suits set you back over a thousand bucks, but there's this company called Indochino. 
Indochino, and they do custom made-to-measure measure, uh, suits and shirts that fit you perfectly, and they're at a really good price. They use super fine fabrics. You get to customize your lining, your lapels. You, you, you do your own uh, like personal monogram. Don't put Mr. Greenfield on yours. That would be creepy. Mr. Greenfield only goes on mine. But anyways, it's really easy. You just drop into any of their showrooms, and you pick out what you want for fabrics and patterns, and then you after you uh, choose your customization, you just kick back and relax and get ready within four weeks to step into a perfectly fitting suit that makes you look really good. So the way that you can do this and you get this suit for $389, which is a fantastic price for a custom suit, you just go to Indochino.com, I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O, Indochino.com, and you enter code FITNESS at checkout. That gets you 50 percent off the regular price for a made to measure premium suit and shipping is free and i think every dude needs to have at least one freaking killer suit and this is the time to do it that's a really good discount code by the way 50 percent. so indochino.com and use promo code fitness now the other thing that i wanted to tell you about is a box that showed up at my doorstep and it's got this writing on the outside of it that says bark box So I thought maybe somebody sent me bark, like for composting the garden. And I opened it, and it was chock full of toys, like dog toys. We're talking like little squeaky balls and little chew things and these like like jerky type of things for the dog's teeth, all sorts of things that the dog can play with. And my kids went ape nuts because all of a sudden they've got like six or seven new toys to throw around to the dog. And the dogs are just completely enamored with this stuff. And frankly, the dogs are not getting into things they shouldn't be getting into because they have all of these new toys from this company called Bark Box. And the way that this works is every month, Bark Box paw picks. See what I did there? Paw picks, P A W picks. They they pick the best all natural treats and innovative toys to match a dog's needs. And this would include things that are hypoallergenic or things that you can customize for like the dog's chewing preferences. And a hundred percent of their products are tested on their animals before they're shipped to you to make sure that an animal freaking loves this stuff. And actually, if your dog doesn't like anything in the box, they send you replacements for anything that your dog would love for free. They're all about dog happiness. That's actually a really cool idea. It's like a it's like a quarterly type of shipment for dogs. You just tell them how big your dog is and they ship it to you. I've got a Rhodesian Ridgeback and a Blue Healer and they just ate up this box. Literally. Each box has four to six treats in it, a whole bunch of super fun toys, and it's like the joy of a million belly scratches for your dog. So you can get this for free. You get a free extra month of BarkBox when you subscribe to a six or a 12 month BarkBox plan. And all you do is you go to BarkBox.com. Bark like a dog does. BarkBox.com slash Ben. And when you go to BarkBox.com slash Ben, you get shipped to your door, toys, treats, dog edibles, and an amazing unboxing experience that your dog is going to flip out over. So check them out. BarkBox.com slash Ben. Ben. When, when you're training musicians, I mean, I, I don't know, but in, for, in most cases, uh, a lot of musicians, you know, I, I suppose unless you're like Britney Spears in her, in her heyday or, or some of these, uh, you know, modern musicians who are dancing on stage or uh, I even think... Uh, What's his face? The young, the young, uh, young boy. I am feeling so old right now. Um, That's all right. Justin, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Justin, Justin. Bieber. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, okay. <laughs> um, Justin Timberlake. Some of these guys, like they're they're in pretty yeah. good shape. But um, you know, most musicians aren't in that great of shape, in my opinion, at least. They're That's correct. Really good musicians, but music is not necessarily a a high calorie burning activity unless you're dancing hip hop. So, in the case of musicians. Uh, when you're training musicians, is it more kind of like keeping them from dying by putting them in Nautilus exercise machines? Or did you have like a specific training approach that you use with folks like that? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because it depends on the instrument they play. I mean, great question. So uh, just to back up a bit, yeah, we see hip hoppers running around and expending a lot of energy. So we think of them as the people that need the cardio core like work. Um, But remember, before there was that, there was uh, Mick Jagger, 
and uh, Mick Taylor, um, not Mick Taylor. Um, uh, oh God, now I'm now now I'm missing a name. Uh, Aerosmith's lead singer. Oh yeah, that's um. <laughs> Why can't I get it? I guess gotta look it, that up. Uh, he he was on Steven Tyler. Uh, yeah, Steven Tyler. Tyler. Steven, Steven Tyler. Tyler. Yeah, he was on, on Ameri- America. Uh, what what is it? Uh, yeah, he, the, he I, I on, so do not watch TV. Um, yeah. The idol, on, America's yeah, idol, yeah, American, American idol. idol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you think about people like that, that are enormously full of energy and running around the stage and burning calories, these people take that workout very seriously. So uh, to be succinct, you might with uh, a drummer who's who's f- you know flailing all over the place back there. Uh, depending on the band, some of them are very staid, quiet, and relaxed, but. Lots of rock and rollers are really moving around. So the lead singers, if they're active people like Mick Jagger or uh, Steven Tyler, uh, they need to be moved around quite a bit. They might have to do some sprint work, uh, 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 really power up the quads and hams, really get the lungs stretched and breathing out uh, some core work. And you might take someone like a bass player who are historically known and classically known as the gentlemen of the band. If you, if you watch bands play, and you just focus on the bass player, most of the time you'll see they sort of look like the relaxed, nice guy in the band. And the lead guitar player is always the guy who's, you know, ripping it up and trying to get the girls. They're all trying to get the girls, but more than anybody, uh, the lead guitar player. Um, so you might, uh, and, and, and bringing up the lead guitar player too, some of those guys, think of Chuck Berry, that's going way, way back. Let's, let's, bring it, let's bring it more current. I can't think of anyone more current, actually, on, on the lead guitar. But those guys might need some cardio core, too, because they tend to work around, uh, to walk around, run around, and make a lot of noise. You know who would be an example? Angus Young of ACDC. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy who's just all over the stage and making noise. And so, so, but the bass player, you know, uh, the keyboardist, these people who are sort of quiet and more relaxed and rhythm players um, – yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It would be a slower routine, maybe a more uh, two four routine or a Nautilus like routine. Or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. But but you're not doing that anymore, huh? You're not you're not training musicians. No, I you know sometimes I look back at that and think you know what was I thinking? Man, it was stupid to leave that business. I had a I had a great clientele, a lot of interesting people. I was very good at it. People liked me, and uh, it was it was fun to do, but. I still didn't know at that time what I really wanted to do. And, uh, well, what happened was one of my clients was a very famous, quietly famous and legendary commodities trader. And what happened was uh, I walked into his house one day and I saw these computers and these lights blinking and he, yeah. Multiple screens. It was crazy. And it was, and it was, uh, it was a different scene then than it is today. But I didn't know I was standing in front of a legend here, as I say, a quiet legend. This was not a person whose name you didn't care about attention, didn't care about any of that stuff. He had other things that he was interested in, health, fitness, supplementation, uh, healthy living. All these things were interesting to him. In fact, he, he's such a fascinating guy that I'd say that, and I don't mean to deviate here, but this guy, this guy's real talent was his brain. He was really interested in psychology. That was his real work. And, and becoming a legendary trader was sort of like a natural outshoot of his personality. He just was, he just happened to be really good at it, but he had other things that he was much more interested in. Crazy combination. But I, so I met this guy and he was a major influence on me in many, 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 many ways. Became my best friend eventually, but I saw what he was doing. He had this big house overlooking the bluff in Malibu. You know, he was an independent guy doing his own thing and and making a lot of money. And uh, that all was very appealing and very attractive to me. So I said, hey, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a I'm a commodities trader. And I said something like, oh, like uh, like trading places with with Ackroyd and Murphy. And he said, yeah, something like that. And uh, he was he ended up being a client of mine. And uh, I learned the business of commodities trading from him. And I left private fitness for a little while to go to Chicago to work on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange through his door opening. So that became a big part of my life too. So big deviation. I know we weren't huge expecting- deviation. Yeah, you went into <laughs> the whole like financial money making world, and and I know you told me you wound up you wound up doing pretty well. Like you grew some companies, did an IPO, you you created yes. like a half billion dollar market cap. Yes, yes, and then that yeah, all that got was- wiped out. Yeah, yeah, that that's uh, boy, I tell you, that's that's I I don't want anyone to ever have to go through something like that. So if we just jump away from the trading thing for a bit, we get into the '90s during the dot com revolution. I was fortunate enough to to start a company from practically scratch, three five people, and uh, 
the short story is we, we grew that company over five years to about a thousand people over multiple states. We took it public and eventually had about a half a billion dollar market cap. And I was cashing out at about $10 million uh, waiting for me to cash out. And uh, I picked my spot. Now, my spot was November, December of 2001. That's when I was going to make my move, cash out, and then start doing more things like what you and I are doing right now, sort of move into these sort of things then. But as everyone knows, November, December in 2001 was just a little bit too late because in September, the Trade Center went down thanks to Osama bin Laden and that wealth and the company. Everything got completely wiped out, just gone. So uh, bro brokenness started September 11th for me. <laughs> but a week, wow. later, I was, a week later, I was worth nothing. <laughs> so, you know, you... You just learn how to cope with that. It was a dream come true to build a company from nothing to something. It was a realization of a dream, of one of my dreams. Yeah. And that realization just literally went up in flames. Now, now of course, we lost a lot of people, and that's much more tragic than anything I went through. And my heart goes out to the families of all the people that, that lost loved ones during that time and the subsequent wars that followed. But uh, it's still it's still tough to forget what you went through and your own experience and what happened to you when those sort of things go down too. So, you know, you just pick up the pieces, you just start over again. You just figure out, you figure out how to start over. You really have to do that. You don't just start over and go, well, hey, I know the recipe to success. I'll just do it again. It doesn't quite work that way, or it didn't for me. I, I had to I had to take a couple of years to get my balance back. And then when I did, you know, started to move in the right direction again. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now you're, you're knee deep in figuring out, uh, I guess, uh, how to, how to crack like the, the altitude nut, like you got into mountaineering. Well, what happened was during that same time, a really cr crazy story had come out in 1996. So, you know, in and around that same time, there was a major event on Mount Everest where, where a, a dozen or more people were killed in a very tragic accident. And a subsequent book was written about it called Into Thin Air. And I strongly recommend it. Oh, yeah. Yep. I've read that book. It's It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing book. The, a, for me, it was a trifecta type of thing. I didn't expect Krakauer to be that good of a writer. I just thought mm -hmm. I was going to read the story of the accident and be done with it. But it turns out that Krakauer is not only a great writer, but he's got sort of a dark side to him that I picked up on, you know, this, this sort of angst in his soul. And I connected with that. And not only did he write really well, but I could feel some of his own stuff in that book. And then, and then reading the backstories – yeah. And, and for people who don't know, like that, that whole Into Thin Air book, and I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig. Um, that is about the Everest disaster where, where Krakauer, or Krakauer get, gets up to Everest. I, I believe he wrote this in like the 90s. And uh, when he turned around to start his descent after he summited, there were 20 other people going to the top as a big storm rolled in and it just wound up destroying this, this climbing party that was going up Everest. But it, I mean, the, the way the book is written, I, I obviously didn't do it any justice just now, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's a thriller. Right. Yeah. So I strongly recommend that nobody waste their time watching the movie. It doesn't do the book justice. There's no way to get the fullness in the depth and the profundity of this experience without reading the book. And you will not be disappointed. This is a page turner. And uh, so what happened was I was reading the book and I thought, these people are crazy who do this kind of work. I mean, all I did was train like a madman, you know, up to six hours a day during my heyday when I was training hard up to six hours a day, you know, maybe on the low days, you know, three hours and seven days a week. So in season, you know, so I was doing a lot of hard, crazy work to get somewhere. But it looked to me like these people who climb these four, the, these, these, uh, not 14ers, I was about to say 14ers, but these, you know, 20,000 foot peaks and 30,000 foot peaks, which is what Everest is, are completely batty because, because the amount of training it takes to do it, the amount of time it takes to prepare for it, and the desire to be on a, a mountain like K2 or Everest, you, you just got to be a little out of your mind because there are these, in, in mountains this, this tall, you're going to be familiar with this, Ben, but there's, there are these, for, besides the fact it's just plain dangerous to do. You know, the minute yeah. you get out of base camp, your life's on the line with every step you take from base camp to the top and back. And everyone knows coming back is tougher than going up on these mountains. So so if you just just take that. Yeah, but that's that's why people do it. I mean, if it was easy, 
<laughs> then no, no, everybody no, would yeah, be out climbing right. Everest. Right. But let's add, let's add a factor of, oh, I don't know, 30 to this now in terms of danger. There's a zone on both of these mountains, K2 and Everest, in, in mountains like this called the Death Stone. And in the Death Stone, which you know about, there is no it, – it's the worst place to be because if you don't have oxygen on, you, you're likely not going to make it. You're going to die. And with oxygen on, you know, when you stick on that mask and you have that oxygen on, you're still moving at, an, at half a snail's pace. When you say one foot in front of the other, it's more like one half a step in front yeah. of Yeah, and, and it's kind of crazy. I haven't done as extreme an amount of climbing as you have at this point. But yeah, one tiny step can gas you and a few tiny steps in a row will leave you at that altitude feeling as though you've been like, you know, running an 800 meter on a track at sea level Exactly. with just a few tiny steps. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. And, and so how, how deep into mountaineering have you gotten? All right. So I, I haven't been, I'm glad we're talking about that because I didn't get that deep into it. I'll just tell you that. So what happened was I read this story and I thought these people were batting out of their minds. And after a couple of months, I thought, you know, I think it's worth finding out what these people are going through. And so my version of it, which is nothing at all compared to what those people went through, was reaching out to my brother, who was a world-class climber and had been, as long as I'd been swimming, he'd been climbing mountains. So we just happened to have it in the family. So I called him up and said, hey, you know, you guys are batty. You're all completely out of your mind. I don't know what it is that possesses you to do this stuff, but... I need to experience it. I need to find out what it is you guys are going through and what that's all about. So <laughs> that begins my first disastrous event trying to climb uh, the Grand Teton in Wyoming. And uh, so my, my brother remembers me as his world-class athlete and always in ripped up, you know, 6% body fat, great shape and able to to run mountains and jump buildings and all that stuff. And But I wasn't 22 anymore. You know, at this point I was, uh, I was in my forties and I said, and he goes, so look at, yeah, this would be great. You come along, you know, just show up, you'll be fine. I said, well, what do you mean show up? He said, just show up. I got to train for this stuff. He goes, no, 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 you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Don't, don't Ben, don't ask me why I listened to him. I figured he knew something I didn't know. Okay. I, I, well, he's the climber. He knows my background. He knows I'm out of shape now, but he must know something I don't know. So I listened to him and I showed up and this was a, going to be a trip of, of summoning three mountains in Wyoming, the Teton being the last of them, which is, a four, uh, I think it's right around 14. It's a little under. I had to opt out. So 10 days, three mountains. I had to opt out after failing on the first mountain because I was so out of shape. My legs hurt so bad. It was almost impossible it's for crazy. me to get That's back. how bad it got from being a swimmer training for the Olympics to, to going into business and the dot-com industry yeah. and trading and everything, huh? Yeah, if you're not training, if you're not working out, you know, it's like a language and you know this better than anybody. If you're not doing it, it's just going to leave you. It's just going to go away. Now, the upside is if you've got background, you know what to expect when you start training hard again. You know what pain is. You yeah, know see, that, that's that's the point is, is anybody I think goes compete at the level that you have. Once you get back into training, you get fit so much more quickly. Like my wife, she ran cross country in college. And when she puts her mind to, like, let's say, training for like a, a Spartan, which she's done a few times. She will, she will be hella fit within about two months. I'm and yeah. and by fit, I mean she'll go out and and crush, you know, which which for her is pretty decent, like you know, sixteen and a half, seventeen minutes in a five k, and and be able to just go out and and you know, she qualified for Spartan World Championships this year on like six weeks of training just because she is is so used to she 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 was trained to go to the pain cave at an early age. I think that's a big advantage for a lot yeah. of people, and I know that you as a swimmer. Not only did you get trained for the pain cave, but you got trained for for pretty extreme sensory deprivation too. Your wife's an amazing athlete, but uh, I'll give my brother the one who who dragged me into this. The way he dragged me into it, credit for, for for understanding what you just said, because I went to graduate school back in the '90s too, and I remember him saying, "Look, Craig, this will be a different grind for you. You know, you understand pain and sports and and what all that means to get from A to wherever it is you're going and all the steps in between and all the psychological barriers and physical barriers. You you get that. But uh gonna be a little tougher for you to get your MBA because you were paying more attention to be a uh, to the Olympics at the time than you were to school. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep, you're right. Yeah. If you know the pain cave, you know the pain cave. And if you know academics, you know you know that. You know that that's harder for me. You know so did you eventually summit these three peaks? So 
Yes, I did. <laughs> to another, I'm glad you asked. So I failed out miserably. I mean, when I say I failed out, I limped for like a week after that first attempt, and uh, it was terrible. It was I was embarrassed, you know. And I, you know, my brother had his partner with him, who you know he's been climbing with since they were 15 years old, all climbing buddies. And uh, I was just embarrassed because you know I did have this background, and um, here I was showing them what that background means nothing if you're 20 years out of shape. Yeah, you know, it doesn't mean anything. You, you got to train for stuff if you want to do well. You just have to. There's no getting around it. But so that was a big failure, and I limped for like a week or so afterwards. But uh, and I and while I was doing it, I was thinking, who would do this? This is a miserable experience. I mean, this is this is awful. But I, I really had to realize that it was awful for me because I wasn't I wasn't trained up for it. So I decided to prepare and do it again the next year, and I I did some at one of the mountains. Uh, middle Teton is what it's called. But then I got sick and I had to leave. So the, the next summit was going to be Grand Teton. So that didn't happen. Year three comes along and I decide, you know what, nothing's going to stop me. I'm going back to the, as you put it, I, I like that phrase, Ben, I'm going to start using it. I decided to go back to the pain cave. Uh -huh. And so for that year, I got back into the pool and I swam 3000 yards a day, every day, five days a week. That's I got awesome. into the uh, you know, it's something I know. So, and it, and it helped me with my wind and stamina and all that stuff. Uh, and I got into gym three days a week and I went into a very, very, very heavy, uh, uh, training regime there. And, but most importantly, you know, I was living in Southern California at the time and I had a backpack and during the week I would pack it up with 80 pounds of weight and I'd hike around. I wouldn't go that far during the week cause it's a work week and it's tough and I had already swum and I might've lifted. So during the week I'd go three or four miles with 80 pounds on my back, but every single weekend I jacked it up to 110 pounds and I'd go 10 miles in the, uh, in the mountains of Southern California. So when August finally came and I only had 40 pounds on my back, and with all that training in back of me, I finally did some at the Grand. And I, if you've got time, I'll, I'll tell you a very, <laughs> a very quick, funny story about summiting the Grand. But that's so the answer is yes, I did summit and it took a lot of work to do it. I was happy to do it. And when I finally summited it, as I was going through that process and spending a night on the mountain and, and, and hiking and climbing and, and rappelling and roping off and seeing 3,000 foot exposures and uh, you know, crazy stuff like that. I did see the joy in it because when, like anything, if you're truly prepared for it, whatever it is, and in this case, you know, climbing, if you're truly prepared for it, then then the event is really, really meaningful. And so for me, I've always had the attitude of, you know, make the journey or the training the most miserable aspect of what it is you're going to do if you're aiming for an event so that when you yeah. get to the event, all of that work is behind you. You paid a dear price for it, but you know unequivocally when you show up, I'm ready. I'm yep. ready. Yeah, you uh, you cannot uh, magically pull a trigger and be running, let's say, a, a you know per minute or per 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 uh, minute per mile pace that is you know ten seconds faster than what you ran in training, just because you're in an event and the adrenaline and the epinephrine and everything takes over. It doesn't happen. You actually no. have to go there into the pain cave in your training. I wanted to, I know you have so many side stories to tell, but I want to talk about this bottle of stuff that you sent over to me because I know mm -hmm. it has to do with what we're talking about right now, which is performing and specifically, I, I know that that you uh, you kind of got involved into looking for ingredients that would specifically assist with blood oxygenation. Is that correct? That's exactly right because I was a sprinter. So for me, everything was about getting oxygen and as much as I could. And when I competed, you know, you're not supposed to breathe every stroke as a 50 meter freestyler. And I had a tendency to breathe just about every stroke because I, I just needed to oxygenate more than the average bear. So yes, my whole world's about oxygenation, blood development and oxygenation. I don't think in terms of anything else. Gotcha. So, so what, how did you start to, to dive into the whole, you know, researching of raw ingredients and, and picking out what you were going to put into a bottle to help with something like blood oxygenation? Yeah. So it's a great question too. So I had, a lot of background between, you know, beginning in high school and all the way through my uh, college uh, in a, Olympic training days with sports supplements. And as I said earlier, for me, nothing worked. And I was very into it. I wanted something to work. I was looking for something that would give me a biological edge, but nothing really did. So at a certain point, and I used to take like 30, 33 pills a day, sometimes all at the same time, which wasn't the smartest thing wow. in the world. But I, I used to take a lot of supplements and, and I'd mix them up and I'd try them out. And ultimately, I just said, you know what? 
this is making me sick and nothing's working. I'm not getting sick any, you know, any less and my performances haven't, haven't changed. So, so, so when you were taking like that many pills, were you doing this for, for oxygenation or were you just doing it for your immune system or what was it just like the shotgun approach where you were taking everything at that time? It was a shotgun approach. I was trying to find a balance of things or a combination of things or a single thing that that I felt was going to make the difference in terms of how I could handle my training in the pool. Uh, and subsequently, you know, that that would then lead into how well I would compete. So, no, it was a shotgun approach. I was it wasn't shotgun from the point of view where I'll just try anything. I was doing the research uh, like for bee pollen and royal jelly. These are things that purportedly help, as you mentioned, with, uh, I think, uh, some allergies. But they also have oxygen supporting components to them, too. But I didn't feel like any of that stuff was working. I used to take different kinds of bee supplements, and I didn't find that any one or combination of them was really working. So a lot of time, a lot of time, you know, doing this. I can't say at the time I was doing it scientifically the way a guy like you would today. You're, you're a really great guru in that area and an influence on me in that regard. But at that time, no, I, I'd say I did a lot of reading. I used to, I used to do a lot of research and a lot of reading at a high level, not at the, the, the detail level you do, um, and say, well, this looks like it'll help me with endurance. This looks like it'll give me more iron. This looks like it'll transport more oxygen. This looks like, you know, it'll, you know, help clean my blood. And I went down that road, but nothing worked. So I quit. And what happened was uh, I, I quit taking supplements, that is. And then when I was training for the second Olympic run, I just happened to hook up again in Malibu with a, with a chiropractor doctor who, a very gifted man, uh, still working today, who also happened to be a bit of a guru on, on nutrition. And he wanted to get involved with my Olympic run. And um, said, let me help you with supplements. And I said, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm open-minded, but just so you know, I've never done anything that's worked. And, uh, but I'm way open to that because you probably know something I don't know being the expert in the field. So what happened was we experimented with a few things and just something hit, it just, just something hit. And the combination of things that worked for me, it's a, the product I gave to you is enhanced a little bit with, with, uh, with two ingredients today that I didn't take back then. And I'll, I'll walk you through that. But for me, when I took this concoction, I had a very interesting reaction to it. It took me about a week or so. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long, but I had this, uh, this detoxing effect. That's the only way I know how to describe it. That's the only thing I can think it was. You know what a niacin rush is like, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. I had one earlier today because every once in a while when I go to my uh, my sauna, which I did before I did my cold water swim this morning, I do the hot cold, I will do a form of niacin uh, called niacin, which is like a, it's kind of a non-flushing form of niacin, but if you take enough, you can flush a little bit. And I do that before I do the sauna because it can cause, uh, it can cause fat cells to basically lice under the presence of heat or infrared when you combine niacin with infrared therapy. So yes, I've experienced a flush, um, but uh, I... I try not to take supplements to give a big flush because I don't like that tingly feeling. But that's that's what you got, huh? Well, yeah. So I used to take niacin, so I know what that feeling is like. But uh, there was no niacin in this formula. And yes, I, my body slowly started to go through what felt like a full body tingling rush. And, I, and it came on and it lifted through a period of about 20 seconds. I remember sitting down in the bed and saying, well, this is weird and odd and I don't understand what's going on here, but I could tell it wasn't anything bad. I, I, you know, I could instinctively, I knew it was something, but not anything that I had to really fear. But I sat, I sat down and let the feeling pass. And, and when that was gone, I just said, well, it was weird. I, 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 I just got a feeling I've, cause I, at that time I'd really cleaned up my eating. So, so getting to that question that you brought up earlier at that point, I was eating really clean for the 84 games. And I was taking really high quality supplements. Now stuff I had not taken before, like the blue green algae and uh, chlorella. And now I added desiccated liver to, to the routine here, which is the highest quality. Well, well, anyway, so before I get into the more into the product here, um, I found after that effect, you know, at that point I was training meters just uh, for, for me personally, a dramatic change in my workouts. All of a sudden, I was just able to train at a much higher level. I mean, these things don't happen just right away, but you can feel in the pool or you're running or whatever your gig is, whatever your thing is, you you begin to feel power and strength that you didn't feel before or or an endurance factor that you didn't feel before. And you you furrow your forehead and you go, hmm, something's different. What am I doing different that's you now making me feel better? 
And I would search hard, high and low for what the difference was. And the only difference in my routine at the time, finally, was that I was supplementing with this concoction of stuff that I believed then and I believe now because nothing else was different was what was impacting me and allowing me to train with much greater endurance and much more speed. In fact, during that time in workouts, describing what a workout the type of workout I'm about to uh, go into here is a bit difficult and complicated to make sense to, but they're called broken swims and there are ways to do oh, yeah, very, very, nice. so you know what that is. So there are ways to get very, very high intensity, explosive work done. And uh, so you might, let's say you did, let's just say you did a series of 100 meters or 100 yard swims on, let's just say a minute and 30 or a minute and 10 seconds. And you might swim, you know, 75 yards all out. And then you take five seconds rest at the wall and you go all out again, you know, to, right. uh, to, to, to complete it. Right. You yeah, do that. it'd be like if you're going to swim a 500, you'd split it into 10 by 50 at the Correct. maximum pace that you want to be able to swim at. Or you would Correct. break Correct. a 408 Correct. by 50 or 306 by 50. That's right. They're excellent. That's very, very good. That's exactly right. And the reason for these types of swim is they, they get your body ready for race pace, you know, the, the highest level race pace. And the five second, the broken part of it, the five seconds rest in between, is just to give you some quick oxygen so you don't completely burn out because the idea is to keep that high quality intensity high. And it doesn't stay high at race pace when you're doing 10 of these things if you don't get a second of rest or two in between, you know, one of one of the swims there. So 75 yards is one way to do it, five seconds rest, and then all out for 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 the final 25. And so I was swimming world record pace in workout. I'd never done that before for me. Again, I'm speaking solely for myself. That's how it worked for me. I was having amazing workouts. I was thrilled to death. I was very happy about it. And uh, so I was taking, uh, so what was making the difference for me, I believe at the time, I was taking a combination of blue-green algae, I was, mm -hmm. taking, I was taking beetroot, and I was taking desiccated liver. And the two products that I've added to, to the uh, ingredient uh, list here are cordyceps sinensis and uh, euchanasia. And the reason I added cordyceps is cordyceps has a very strong and documented background for being an, uh, both an ATP producer so to keep that battery charged, which is really critical when you're sprinting. And also it's, it's known, it's believed to have great oxygen carrying capacity. And so my whole thinking now, Ben, I got to explain also at the time, I, I know about cordyceps today. I didn't know about it then. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know exactly what these ingredients were doing for me then. Other than that, I felt spectacular. So it wasn't until the internet age came, you know, sometime later that I was able to do some back study to find out what was going on. So at that point, and, this was just stuff this doctor was giving you? Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. He's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a wild and crazy guy and he is, thinks out of the box and he understood the type of training I was doing. And he, he, he just did some unusual things with me that I, I right. feel uh, you know, made all the difference in the world. So looking back at it, what was going on here was – depending on the blue-green algae you take, and you know a lot about this stuff, um, depending on the type you take – you get action in your chemistry that does things like clean and detoxify blood, increase red blood cell production naturally. You, That's you mean critical. The, you mean the blue green stuff? Yes. Well, yeah. So I was a little bit confused at first when I got this stuff because you describe it as afinazomenon floss aqua, but it's basically like a, a blue green algae extract. This is a particular and rare kind of algae that comes out of Klamath uh, Lake in Oregon right near you. Um, really? and it's the, yep. Yeah, and it's the only place it's grown and it's got the highest content of chlorophyll. Check it out. You'll see that I'm right. And, uh, followed by, I think chlorella and then, uh, spirulina. Oh yeah. You uh, know, yeah. Have you heard of, uh, E3 live before? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, so a lot of people tell me you got to take E3 live, you got to take E3 live. And, and apparently it's, it's made from this blue green algae stuff that's harvested from Klamath Lake. But this, this is the same place that you're getting the, the algae that you're putting into, uh, putting into this biotropic stuff. That's correct. And uh, it, it performs a couple of things for me. Um, I've always been, let's just talk about that for just a second, uh, why I think it's so great. I, I always showed up and I, I got a funny feeling you're like me in this regard, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I never had any issues psychologically showing up ready for an event. I, I always was a great competitor. I couldn't wait to get in the water. I didn't care who you were went toe to toe with the biggest and baddest boys in the world. And none of them scared me. I just couldn't wait to get in and take them out. Sometimes I took them out, but more often than not, they took me out because <laughs> they were, they were better. But I've, you know, I've had, I've had some really great successes as an athlete, but some people, 
don't have that going on. They train hard. They train harder than me, tougher than me, but they have psychological problems or focus problems is really what I want to get on to here. And one of the great things about this particular product, the AFA, is that it's got, uh, it's got some, uh, some chemistry in it that helps with focus. And so one of the reasons I like this product is it creates a clarity, it creates a focus, it's also a mood enhancer. So it lifts you a little bit psychologically if you're one of those people that has a hard time with pressure at competition. It has that component to it. It's called PEA for short. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, it, it's actually hard to describe, but it's, uh, I'll try to do it. It's phenylethylamine. That is the, uh, the actual ingredient that creates that focus, that creates you mean that like, elevated. like the mood enhancing effect. Yes, 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 exactly. Uh, it's also used to some effect with people who have uh, ADD to help increase their focus. So I'm not about personally, I am not personally about having to deal with focus. I don't have that issue. I never did, including today. I, I just know how to show up and, and do it. But not everyone works that way. So this particular product does a couple of things, several things that are very, very cool. In addition to creating an, an, an uplifting sense of self, and, and a greater focus factor. It also is purported to have stem cell repair capability. So you mean the, if you're you some, mean the, the, the chlorophyll? Correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 LG is yeah. interesting stuff. I, I'm I'm a big fan, and it's got a lot of these uh, nucleic acids in it, which I believe is what assists with the the actual repair and the and providing the body with some of the some of the stem cell precursors. But the other cool thing, I don't I don't know if you saw this research. I I uh, read a, a study about uh, sunlight and chlorophyll and how increasing the concentration of chlorophyll in your bloodstream, uh, when that chlorophyll interacts with sunlight, it actually produces adenosine triphosphate or ATP because right. your body's energy currency. So you can actually produce more ATP without eating calories when you have high levels of chlorophyll combined with sunlight exposure, which, you know, when we're talking about something, you know, like I know that you, you designed a big part of this for blood oxygenation and altitude performance, um, it, it is handy to be able to produce extra ATP when you have this chlorophyll in your bloodstream, especially if you have access to sunlight. So that's, that's one of the cooler things I think about, uh, about chlorella and about blue green, but this, this particular AFA is, it's, it's harvested from Klamath Lake and it, it, uh, has specific properties to it based off of where it was harvested from. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It's the only place Unless something has changed uh, since this conversation, it's the only place in the world you can get it. It's very special material, mm -hmm. and uh, I strongly recommend that people try it, whether they try it through my own formulation. My formulation is a combination of things that are designed to to uh, develop blood and increase oxygenation. Yeah. But if someone wanted to try it on their own, I strongly recommend they do it. So, the other thing. Oh, go yes, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, you've also got the, the cordyceps in there because I want to make sure – during the, the amount of time that we have left on today's show that I, I touch on some of the other things that are in here because I wanted to ask you about the cordyceps. So this this sinensis, sinensis is that form of cordyceps that's actually, is this the one that they like harvest from like larvae of fungus? That's correct. Uh, Tibetan grown and, and that is exactly correct. <laughs> Can you make it sound a little better? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it comes out of, it comes out of like fungal, I don't know, like ghost, ghost moth butt, basically. They, they produce like a, like a fruiting body and, and you harvest that. But the, I know a lot of, a lot of folks in, in Asian medicine or Eastern medicine use this. I know a lot of like Sherpas who climb Mount Everest will use cordyceps, but the basic idea behind it, you were saying is, uh, oxygenation or VO2 max? Yes. Uh, both, uh, oxygenation, it's, it's purported to have very strong oxygen carrying capabilities as well as, uh, increase in ATP. And I, I always think in terms of well, all three of those things, ATP, oxygen, and, and blood development. So some of this stuff doubles up. It overlaps. Um, chlorella creates that effect, and so does cordyceps sinensis. So we double up on the oxygen piece of it there and the ATP piece as well. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, so we've got cordyceps, and it's a, it's sinensis is how you pronounce that, right? Correct. That's right. Okay, uh -huh. so, so that's the specific brand of, of cordyceps or flavor of cordyceps. Then you also have um, beet in here. And I know a lot of people already know about beetroot as like a vasodilator. It's like, you know, full body Viagra. But I wanted to ask you if you saw this recent study on beetroot, because, you know, we talked about cold water swimming. And one of the reasons that I do it is so I get that you know, white adipose tissue to brown fat conversion. They did a study with beetroot where they found that the nitrates in beets accelerate the conversion of white fat tissue to brown fat tissue. And so you can actually use something like this, like prior to exercise or specifically like prior to cold exposure 
to accelerate uh, fat loss in terms of white, white fat to brown fat conversion. Have you seen this research? That's very interesting. I, that's new to me. I'll have to look that up and learn more about it. Yeah, it came out last year, and, and in it, they actually used uh, inorganic nitrate uh, from beets to turn regular white fat tissue into calorie-burning brown fat tissue. It's really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely look that up. Yeah, I'll link to the study in the show notes. But there's the, you've, got, you've got the beets in there, which I, I know a lot of people know about. A lot of people have also heard of echinacea before for the immune system, but you also are putting it in there for, for the blood well, so echinacea is really well documented for for immunity, so, uh, immune support. And uh, being an athlete, uh, we know being athletes, we know that, uh, especially when we're when we're in high training, that uh, we tend to walk a fine line between sickness and health. We're always healthy, but might get a cold easier because we're broken down. And especially when you're training at a very, very, very high level, and that's all you do all day long. Those those people are always they're always sort of fighting with that. And it's worse than it looks because you see the professional athletes out there all the time. Well, guess what? They're playing. They're not letting you know. They're, they go out there sick all the time and play. The only time they – I mean, think of Michael Jordan when he had to play against uh, the Utah Jazz in the NBA semis. He went out there with a the flu for seven games. He had no choice. He had to play. And a lot of athletes are uh, are dealing with it all the time. So it's in there for additional immune support. But, but Euganesia is also known. It's been purported to have – gentle red blood cell production and the science of which is too too much to go in right now but it's worth you doing your own research whoever's listening and and uh, validate that for yourself but that's one of the reasons I put it in there because I argue of course that if you have vasodilation like we talked about with beetroot you have cleaner blood and more ATP uh, going to hard working muscles and more red blood cells carrying oxygen and cordyceps also increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of your system, then you're going to get it when you need it most. And that's when you're training or, or in competition. So uh, yeah. that's, that's why I have that. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I hadn't really thought about using echinacea before for like red blood cell boosting or altitude performance until I, I read it on your label and started looking into it. And it turns out there actually is some, some pretty good research behind echinacea and, and blood building properties, uh, in terms of, uh, I know that it compares somewhat to EPO in terms, like you know, the the illegal right. uh, erythropoietin uh, uh, blood cell precursors that people will use as a as an illegal performance enhancing supplement. Echinacea is right up there with EPO in terms of the the ability to build new red blood cells. So I thought that was really interesting. And then the the last one you have in here, in addition to the the blue green algae, the cordyceps sinensis, the beetroot, and the echinacea is the mouthful. The Argentinian grass, <laughs> grass-fed, uh, clean, defatted, vegan liver and hydrate. Yeah. Fill yeah. me in on this All one right. and why it's in there. So there is no better source that I know of, and things change and things flux and, you know, the world changes, but as of this conversation, there's no better source of the highest grade, cleanest, B suite of vitamins, which I really believe in, especially the oxygen and energy uh, parts of the B suite, 12, 6, 3, and so on. Uh, it's all right there, and, and there's no better source than, than coming from liver. So that's just all there is to it. Some people uh, um, be very transparent about this. It's an animal product, and if, if you are insistent upon not having an animal product in your body, don't take it. You know, Find, find something you're comfortable with and happy with. But the way around that and it's really not the way around it. It's the right thing to do. It's just to get the cleanest possible form of it you can. So you find a vegan-fed cow. You find vegan-fed liver. And uh, so this is Argentinian, you know, grass-fed, non-hormonal, defatted. There's no fat in it. You know, vegan-fed liver. And that's why it's in there because it's the it's the best possible quality you can get uh, of that suite of vitamins, as well as other vitamins and minerals that come with uh, with this particular ingredient. So for me, it was critical to be in there because that was one of the products that I took during the time when I was training that I felt made a big difference in my performance because I can't say that it was grass-fed at that time, but I felt that that suite of vitamins coming from that source was by and large the best of anything I ever took. Yeah, and and I really again like like in terms of fat soluble vitamins, I think a lot of people know that liver is a really good source of fat soluble vitamins. But what I didn't know was some of the research that you have on your website. I I, I believe it was Doctor Urshoff who did research. <laughs> um, it was on yes. lab animals, not humans, but they found some really significant increases, like seven hundred plus percent increases in time to exhaustion when when getting uh, desiccated liver into their bodies in, in high amounts. So it's really interesting, uh, the, the, great uh, the research on this. 
I yeah. think it's great. And I just say for anyone who's, you know, thinking twice about if you are thinking twice about it, look at, um, you know, it, it's, it's a vegan fed. It's as clean as you can possibly get source of the best suite of vitamins that you can put into your body, especially for, uh, for training. And even if you weren't training, if you weren't doing anything competitive, you should take it anyway. But, uh, yeah, it's, I, I held per- onto that little bottle. I mean, it's, it's been, I guess, probably about six months since you sent me that bottle. I held onto it for a few months and I took it on a hunting trip at elevation and loaded with it because most of the research that I've seen, on increasing performance at altitude not only involves moving to and training at altitude which can be impossible in many cases but also taking the type of supplements that allow one to say uh, build new red blood cells or to increase your your levels of inorganic nitrate in your body from something like beetroot they're loading for anywhere from 10 to 17 days in most studies when you're using something to help you perform at altitude so i started using it uh prior to going on that trip and then just basically hunted hard for about a week. And I also took a bunch, uh, going into this recent, uh, Spartan world championships, which was up at Lake Tahoe, the ultra beast up at Lake Tahoe. And I felt great on, uh, you know, both times that I loaded with it and that I took it, you know, usually if I, uh, if I take something, I don't like the way it makes me feel or it gives me explosive diarrhea, for example, <laughs> or it's just a crap <laughs> supplement. I am not going to talk about it on the show. But I, I actually do dig this stuff, and I'd say just about just about anybody who's who's wanting to perform at altitude, or if you've got like issues with, say, anemia, you know, I know we have to be careful making yes. med- medical claims, but you know, you don't want to take a bunch of iron. I could see it coming in handy for that type of thing too, or for you know, say if you've given a lot of blood and you want to build your blood more quickly, anything that would involve building blood or oxygenating blood. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say that, that this stuff is, is, uh, pretty good for just from my own personal experience and, and looking into the research behind the ingredients. So, um, it's a good job, man. I mean, I, I, I like the blend. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it, especially coming from you. I have, as I say, great respect for you and I've got, uh, you know, look at not everything works for everybody. So, you know, try it. If it doesn't work, no problem. Just, just send it back. And I have other, two other, uh, blood oxygen support products that are going to be coming to market pretty, yeah. pretty quick here. That's and awesome. so, uh, yeah, because, you know, look at product A may work and B doesn't and C does, and, you know, maybe none of them work, but it just, Going back to what we were saying earlier, some things work for somebody and some things don't work on other bodies. So you've got to have more than one way to skin a cat. So that's what I'm doing here. This this works. This worked brilliantly for me. I appreciate the kudos from you. Thank you. And uh, keep an eye out for other stuff that I'm bringing up that I that I know works also. Yeah, and I know that folks, if they want to, can get a discount on this stuff. I believe the, the code is just Ben to get a discount yeah. on your website. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, biotropic. You can go to Ben dot com slash biotropic if you just want to go straight to his website. It's like bio, like biology, and then tropic, like the tropics. Um, but biotropic, um, it's called the biotropic blood oxygenating supplement. You use code Ben to get a twenty percent discount. Uh, and free shipping on that. I think you can use that pretty, is that a one-time use code or can folks just use it whenever? No, for your people, it's uh, free shipping, 20% off. It's deeper than 20% really, cause it's discounted on the site already. So it'll be closer to 25%, but uh, free shipping, it's an un- unlimited use and they can share it so that uh, for your people, they can use it forever. Cool. Cool. I like it. And, and of course, if you have questions about this stuff, you know, usage, ingredients, anything like that, um, you can uh, leave your questions or your comments and either Craig or I will reply. You can do that over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig. So that's where the show notes are at. I'll link to some of the other stuff we talked about, like that beet juice brown fat study I mentioned, uh, the Into Thin Air book that I do recommend that you add to your reading list if you haven't read that one yet. Um, and and a few of the other things that we talk about in today's show. So Craig, I want to thank you for your time and for coming on the show today and sharing this stuff with us, man. It's, it's pretty fascinating how you went from swimming to mountaineering and now, uh, now figuring out how to oxygenate people's blood. (laughs) Well, yeah, look at, I appreciate you having me on the show today. The next, the next challenge is next summer. I'm trying to do a long haul hike. I want to do the continental divide trail. It's about a six month program. And so I'm training for that right now. And this is a big uh, part of helping me get there. So uh, you keep, keep moving on. Thanks, Ben. I really appreciate the time today. Cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And for those of you listening in, check out bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Craig. And until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Craig Dinkle, signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have a healthy week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. 
Go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.